blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms, Lord the Lord. shining jesus light of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth you now bring us shine on me shine on me shine jesus shine Obviously, worship is not perfect because we are not in the kingdom of God as of yet, but we are working our way there, are we not? Let us, if you would please remain standing and hear these words from Psalm 46. In this psalm, God is speaking to us. He is speaking to the listener and he's proclaiming who he is and who he is in relation to us. So hear these words from Psalm 46. It says, be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. At times, we don't remember to be still and to know who God is. Maybe you're leading worship and the slides just suddenly stop working. But in those moments, we stop, we take a breath, and we are still in the presence of God and who God is to us. So this week, I challenge you to slow down, to think about who God is to you, and to be quiet in his presence. If you would sing with me, how great is our God. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, it trembles at his voice, it trembles at his voice. How great is all 
Good to see you this morning. Just a couple things that you need to know about. Welcome to Second Branch Baptist Church. If you are a newcomer to us today, we're excited that you're here. On the back of the bench in front of you, you'll probably see a, a blue card there. You can grab that and fill it out if you're a newcomer, and it just lets us know that, that uh, we can come see you, stalk you, get your bank account information, do all of that uh, good stuff that churches love doing to people. Uh, we really would just like to connect with you, and if you could just drop that in the offering plate as it goes around, we would love to be able to just give you a call or send you a note and uh, let you know a little bit more about what happens here at Second Branch Baptist. So glad to see each of you. Almost all of you are new faces to me. If you're a newcomer, my name is Chris. I am the lead pastor at Second Branch Baptist. This is my second Sunday here. So um, if you don't recognize anyone, join the club. I am, I'm in that. Um, a couple things that you do need to know about, we have some uh, young people that are outside in our Welcome Center area after the service this morning, as well as downstairs in our fellowship hall. It is a Cancer Awareness Sunday, and we are doing everything that we can to try to raise awareness as well as raise some funds in order to benefit the American Cancer Society, I believe. So buy some lemonade. If you have a dollar to give, then give it. If you don't have a dollar to give, then give 10. And, and, uh, and I know that those young people out there, they're so excited. I told them they should take our offering because they were like, hey, you need to buy this right now. And, and people were just giving money. It was crazy. Um, if you are interested in serving next Monday in our Friends of the Homeless ministry, you can sign up out there in the Welcome Center. Right beside the Welcome Desk is a white dry erase board. You can sign up out there, please, and, uh, and be a part of that. I think that it happens in the day, a week from tomorrow. Also, beginning in the first Friday in August, uh, Friday evening, conversations at the branch. You can look, uh, and, and look into your bulletin and get a little bit more information about that. Uh, conversations at the branch. Also, if you're on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, we've been posting some information about uh, conversations at the branch as well as some of our recaps from our previous sermon. Uh, join our social media following. It's information in your program, your bulletin there. Um, and then the last thing you need to know about our, is uh, we're looking at increasing our volunteer base for our children's ministry. We're hoping and praying that our children's ministry begins to grow as young families come into our church and experience the love and joy that we have to, to share with them. And as that happens, we see an uptick and an increase in our children, and many of those children's ministry workers are there every week. I spoke with someone this morning who says that she's been in the nursery for 25 years. 25 years. We need to give her some, some help. <laughs> she, had this, uh, she had a child on her lap, and this music was going on from a kid's toy, and I said, have you memorized that song yet? And she says, yes, after 25 years, you're probably sick of that song. So we're trying to increase our, our, our children's ministry volunteer base. Our children's ministry and our student ministry is really the, uh, the crutch of which our church has to be able to lean on. That is the future of our church membership. It actually currently is our church. I think sometimes people think that children and young people are the church of tomorrow. They're actually the church of today. They're just a younger generation of the church of today. And yet, because they are younger and, and uh, need to have some people that are mentoring them and pouring their lives into them, we're asking for as many people as possible. If you can walk, you can hold children, you can love on children, we're asking for you to be interested in signing up to be a part of our children's ministry volunteer base. There will be more information about that coming forth, but please, in your mind, begin thinking, is that something that I could give up a Sunday a month to be able to go serve in, in one of those areas? So we're going to ask our ushers to come forward. We're going to receive our offering now. Giving is one of the ways that we worship the Lord. The Bible says that God has given good gifts. He says that in the book of James. And all through Scripture, you see that God is a generous God. He gave of himself to the patriarchs. He gave of himself through Jesus. And so this is our version of representing a generous God. We give back. And the, one of the things that we do with giving is uh, we keep the lights on. But we also look at other ways that we can be involved in this community to be able to do great work to represent God 
in Chesterfield County. Let's pray together. Lord, thanks so much for the ability to give. We do not take that lightly or take that for granted. So God, would you please be creating the mentality of cheerful giving in our lives. And we know that giving is not just monies. It's not just tithes. It's giving of talents. It's giving of time. Lord, would you create this passion within us to be a giving people? As we pray and and we look forward to our church growing, we know that we're going to have to have people that are generous in their time and giving in that regard. So God, would you create in our hearts that generosity that is representative of who you are? When we look at the increasing our ability to connect with people outside of our walls, would you create this heart of generosity for, for us to be able to give our talents to you? So God, there are people in our in our, in our membership, in our audience this morning who have such talents that you have gifted them with, would you begin spurring in their hearts a vision of what it looks like to use the gifts and talents that you have given them generously so that we can give back? Lord, meet our needs this morning. Help us to have vision for reaching the generation around us. Help us have vision for expanding your kingdom. God, bless us, please, through our through our broken efforts at times, to just bring honor and glory to your name. And we pray this in the power of your name. Amen. Thank you, buddy and Cecil. At this time, our wow kids can head on back to, no? Oh, they're gonna stay. Excuse me, I'm wrong again. They're going to wait a second for Miss Tori Hughes and Emily Harris. They are two of our younger members who are Abigail girls. You've been watching the slideshow above. That is the week that they have had, and they're gonna share a little bit with us. 
When we first arrived on the dusty dirt road, we saw joyful children running barefoot in the grass. We hopped out of the van to see some shy children coming towards us. As we started to hand out the different items, I watched the children's face, faces light up. I found it amazing how the children were so incredibly grateful for a simple pair of $1 flip-flops. I had expected to see a few sad-looking children who took their flip-flops and left, but instead I saw normal children who were so grateful to receive simple things that we take for granted. We had the opportunity to meet a little boy named Amir, and it happened to be his birthday, so we went out and bought him a soccer ball. That night, we went to the camp where he lived, and after giving gifts to the other children, we went to see Amir. His family offered us chicken nuggets, and we got to play different sports with Amir and his friends. As we all piled in the van, Amir knocked on the window and asked us if we could come back tomorrow, which made it all worthwhile. On our way home the next day, we stopped to have some fun. We went to the beach and to the Brown Dog Ice Cream Parlor with the money provided by Mr. Joe. Our leader, Mrs. Rhonda Marston, told us that there are always three different groups involved in a mission trip, the senders, the missionaries, and the receivers. In this case, this church was the sender. We were the missionaries, and these children were the receivers. Thank you so much for all of your prayers and support. Without all of you, this could not have been possible. Thanks. And thank you again, Tori and Emily, for your love of God and your love of missions. At this time, our WOW kids will head on to their church. WOW is Worship Our Way, and it is held in the older part of the building. Y'all may head on out. Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12, please. We're going to pick up in a little bit where we left off last week. We are in our series called Journey Home, a life study on the character of Abram, also known as Abraham. And today we'll pick up here in Genesis 12. We started off there last week at our homecoming service, and we looked at when God was calling him and his family away from Ur, and then they stopped in Haran. And when they were in Haran for a number of years, uh, Abram's father passed away. And after that, then they traveled on toward the land of Canaan that God had told him to go. So we're going to pick up there this week. But before we get there, I just want to tell you, um, you know, say when you're a, a newcomer or a staff member, a new, a new person to a, to a new job, whether, whatever that is, whether it's a church or, or a business, that there's a, ho- a honeymoon period. Well, the honeymoon period is officially over, apparently. Uh, I, I didn't know. I thought it was supposed to last like a year or two. Uh, I was in my office this, mo- this week. I don't know names, so uh, I don't think this individual is in the building. But I was confronted by a person who I thought, I felt like they were uh, going to take my life, really. I was just so scared. Like, I was so, so afraid of what was happening. And um, so I walked away from the, from the confrontation, just kind of trying to to get my bearings to figure out how I'm going to handle this. So I washed my hands, and I got a couple paper towels. And then I went back with those paper towels, and I reached down, and I smashed that spider. <laughs> and I threw him right there in the commode, and he flushed all the way away from me. So no worries anymore. The honeymoon period's over. The spider was trying to kill me. But um, those of you who don't know me well... Uh, I am deathly afraid of spiders, like, like deathly afraid. Um, 
I don't know why that is. It's just kind of this oddity in me that uh, my mom says that she passed it down. She is terrified of spiders as well. I am. I don't know why that is. I will tell you, some of you have heard this before that know me well. Um, if, if I come across a spider web and I don't know where the spider is, I immediately, this might be too much information. <laughs> let, me, let me stop and think. Maybe the honeymoon period will end today. I immediately become a nudist. <laughs> because if a spider web touches me and I don't know where the spider is, my, uh, my immediate assumption is that it's going down my shirt and now the shirt must come off. Not going to lie. We were uh, having a family cookout on our back deck and one of my children says to me, uh, Dad, who was it? Was it Rachel? Dad, there's a spider on your shoulder. Whoop, shirt off. Whoop, shorts down. <laughs> I'm, I don't know what it is about me, but uh, when I saw that spider in my office this, this week, I thought, it's over. Like, all right, it's over. Burn the place down. It's just time to get on with life. Um, hey, a wrap up from last week. We talked, if, and again, if you're on social media, you probably saw this that was going out. That God had a plan, that plan was puzzling to Abram, he couldn't figure it out, he didn't understand why in the world the Lord would want him to leave a, an amazing city like Ur, and then when they established themselves for a number of years in the city of Haran, why in the world God would call him away from these prosperous areas, a place where he and his family could find comfort and have a sense of familiarity, and yet God says, I want you to move away from there. And God's promise to Abram was very personal. I want you to go. It's not just I have a general plan for all of mankind to begin spreading. It wasn't the, the um, Western expansion of the people group. It was God specifically being personal to Abram, saying, I have a plan for you and for your family. Now, I want you to move over here. Don't try to ask why. It's just my plan for you. And that God's promise was powerful that he said, I am going to protect you. The maker of heaven and earth is going to have, his, have your back, and so I'm going to protect you. You don't have to worry about that. And then God says, I want you to be a blessing to all the peoples, all of them. So God was in the business of measuring how effective Abram's response to his call was going to be. And that's hugely important to us because as God is as calling each of us in order to step into his kingdom, he's saying to us that I have a plan sometimes that's puzzling to you, and I just want you to follow me. Or he says, uh, my plan for you is personal, and my protection of you and my promise to you is very powerful, and I want to know that this plan that I've set out for you, you're responding to that in faith, and I am going to give you increase for my kingdom. That's extremely important for us as people and for us as a church. And you've called me to be the pastor of your, of, of your membership, to lead us together into this kingdom that God is calling for every church in America, every church in the world, to be a part of his personal plan to see his kingdom expand. And sometimes when he calls us to move, it is puzzling to us. And it's difficult at times because we all have this sense of comfort and familiarity. And God is saying, well, I want you to go over there. And that's not going to be comfortable and it's not going to be familiar to you. But I have promises that I'm going to establish my kingdom on your shoulders. And you're going to take my kingdom to various places and as a result, I'm going to provide increase to you, and I'm going to see how effective your response in faith is to my calling. That's what I believe that Second Branch Baptist is being called to do. We had lots of conversations with our search team, and then with the personnel team, and then with deacons prior to my coming in, and, and, and just to say, hey, look, Second Branch Baptist has some things that we have to identify what are our errs and our herons that we find comfort and familiarity into that God is saying in order to be actively a part of reaching people in your community, you're going to have to leave. And that's hard. And that can be puzzling at times. 
That was the life of Abram. I believe it's something huge for us to consider as we as a fellowship begin to ask questions. God, what is it that you're calling us to do? And we're going to work together in order to try to figure that out. So let's continue to look here at chapter 12, starting in verse 10. I'm reading from the NIV. It might be a different translation than you have. It says, now there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. Well, he's a smart man. He's telling his wife that she's beautiful. I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you're my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake And my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that she was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, men servants and maid servants and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household, because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me, he said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? So that I took her to be my wife. Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way with with his wife and everything they had. Let's pray together. Lord, would you be at work in my heart this morning as I prepare and have prepared to present your word in a way that makes sense, in a way that is true, in a way that helps us understand what it is that you're asking for us to do in today's society. God, we're not uh, unaware of the fact that Abram had a specific promise that he was going to be the patriarch of the Jewish family and that your Messiah was going to come through his lineage, and so we can't necessarily claim the promise that you gave Abram that Canaan was going to be his land. We, we have no Canaan, God, but what we do have is your kingdom. And your kingdom is established here at Second Branch Baptist. And your kingdom is to expand beyond our walls. And you are calling us, as you called Abram, to leave and to go where people are. And to bring them into your kingdom, just like you told Abram, to go and be a blessing to all the world. So God, would you begin preparing our hearts to receive your truth. May we not reject your truth. I know, God, personally, I'm stubborn, so would you work on my heart to make sure that I am applying your scripture to my life? Do that for all of us, please, God, and pray this in the power of your name, amen. I want you to write down some things. You can open up your program and see that there is some section there for notes for you. I will do this for you every week, so we'll just get into the habit of being able to take notes. I'm a teacher at heart. I taught in the public school system for a while, and I know that when we write things down, it helps us remember things for a later time. So if you can get in the habit of writing these notes down, it would be really helpful for us to be able to apply the lessons from God's Word into the tomorrow and into the next day. I hope that everyone here understands that our, our goal in Sunday morning is to not come and just sit and go home and be unaffected by that. But to have, have God's word reach into the deep parts of our hearts so that we can then apply that to our lives. So I'm going to draw some, can, some observations from the text here that we are going to kind of digest a little bit. And so the first thing I want you to write down is this. Abram got shook. Now if you're 25 years and under, you know what that means. Probably 100% of people under 25 understand what got shook meant. If you're from 25 to 50, probably half of you understand what that means. And if you're over the age of 50, you have no idea what in the world that means. It's kind of a a modern day version of saying got scared or shaken in the knees. You know, you've heard that uh, that cheer from long ago. If you've ever done high school sports, uh, got weak, shaken in the knees, kind of a of a, of a patented uh, cheer for high school cheerleaders. I might be wrong on that. If there's any cheerleaders in the room, forgive me. But got shook is kind of a different way of saying got really scared. And Abram got shook. You look at this, from starting in verse 10, it says, now there was a famine in the land, 
And Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. We may just completely glaze over that when we're, when we're reading this passage and think, well, of course he went down to Egypt if there's no food. That just makes sense. That's rational. That's a logical thing to do to protect your family. What we don't find in this passage is that Abraham is, is acting out of faith. We don't find that anywhere. Remember from last week, God says, I want you to go to the Canaan area. What happens when Abram gets there? No food. What was God's promise to Abram? Wasn't it that he was going to bless him? And yet we find that when Abram arrives at the place that God says, I want you to go, what happens is the situation there is such that it causes Abram to doubt God's plan. Remember last week we said God's plan is puzzling. So Abram arrives and it's like, okay, God, you want me to come here to starve? I mean, that doesn't make sense. So when Abram arrives at the place and this puzzling plan that God has, there's no food for him and his wife and his, and his uh, servants that are all there, his animals, his livestock, his entire legacy is now uh, destined to starve to death. So this promise, quote, that God gave him, I'm going to increase you and I'm going to make you a blessing to all the people, Abram arrives and goes, well, I don't see how that's going to work here. So he goes to Egypt. It's an 11-day journey to Egypt. And I wonder, in any of those 11 days when Abram was walking, did it ever occur to him that the plan that God had set forth, he was now beginning to go against? So we have no indication here whatsoever that Abram is, is operating out of a sense of faith. We have absolutely no recorded scripture where when, when, when Abram arrives in Canaan, God says to him, I forgot to tell you, there's a famine here. My bad. Go down to Egypt. So Abram, he arrives and in, in his immediate reaction is, I'm got, I got shook. I'm afraid. I'm scared. Perhaps his idea of what God's plan was, was he was going to find something that was very familiar to him. Remember, he was living in Haran for, for years, and Haran was an extremely prosperous city. Lots of trade that took place there. If you didn't have food, but you got something, you can trade for food. There are people that are coming and going. Haran was this busy area. And yet he arrives at a place of people that there's no trade market established, there's no prospering here, and Abram says, wait a minute, I'm pretty sure that God's plan for me was going to be something very familiar. Or perhaps he thought, I thought God's plan for me was going to be something very comfortable. And he gets scared about maybe God made a mistake. So let's go down to Egypt which is an 11-day journey. It's not that far compared to where he had come from in Haran. And in Egypt, he's hoping to find familiarity and comfort. Familiarity to him was, we got food. There's people, civilization. I mean, I like that. And he's hoping to find comfort. I don't want to have to wonder where my next meal is going to come from. I would rather just know it's available to me when I want it. When we, when we take a look at Abram's journey here and we, we tie this in from where we were last week and the fact that it's, it's just this puzzling idea, again, I think sometimes we just glaze over Scripture when we read through it and we forget to just stop and pay attention to the things that are happening in Abram's life. I think Abram was an, was an amazing man of faith. He's listed in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, First person listed in Hebrews 11 as a man of faith. But we also have to understand that Abram was not perfect. And I find great comfort in that. Because if God can use Abram to, to reach the people in the entire world, perhaps he can use me too. Because there are times when I struggle with my faith. And I wonder, God, is this plan that you've set forth really what, is, what you're wanting from me? Maybe I should just go down to Egypt for a little bit and hang out down there. So Abram got shook by situations. The famine was a huge situation. He also got shook by his thought life. Look at verse 12. 
He says in verse 12, When the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they'll let you live. See, again, you remember what the promise was? What was the promise that God gave Abram? We talked about it last week. God says, I will bless you and I will make your name great. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And we said last week in our notes that we were taking and it was sent out on social media this week that God's promise is powerful because he's the creator of the universe. And when he gives you his word and his promise, you can probably rest assured that he can accomplish that. And yet we find Abram here who has, I don't know how far it was or how long it took Abram to arrive from Haran to Canaan. We have no timeline of how long it took Abram to get where he was. We know it was about 600 miles from Haran to where he stopped in Canaan. But I don't know how long it took him. He could have taken his time and taken a couple months. Maybe he took six months. I have no idea. But when God told him, this is my promise, somehow along that journey, he forgot that God's promises are powerful. Because he starts thinking his thoughts overtake his his rationality and he starts reasoning his way through faith well God said this but what makes more sense what makes more sense is my family needs to have food regardless of what God said and God says that he would take care of me and he would protect me and that anyone who curses me will suffer the curses of God but that doesn't make sense what makes sense is I have to work out this way that I'm going to live so they won't kill me and take my wife from me. So Abram is just, he's he's scared, he's scared to death. And I realize that there are times in our lives personally and in our times collectively as a church where sometimes we get shook by the things that are happening around us. I realize that. I tread lightly sometimes when I'm having conversations with you because I haven't been a part of your membership in the last year. I mean, I'm here two weeks. And I know in the last year you guys have suffered and you have experienced things that shake you and make you wonder, is our church going to make it? I realize that. But I want to tell you, I want to encourage you this morning that God has a promise for his people and the and the promise is that he protects us the promise is that he has a plan for us and that sometimes that promise even though puzzling needs to come to fruition without our involvement in negating what the promise is abram was so scared to death that he began to make choices let's write this down abram acted out of fear that's not good He acted out of fear. I realize that's common. I mean, that happens to us at times. We act out of fear. I was reading, I don't know that it's true or not, but I was reading a story about a little five-year-old boy who at nighttime was afraid of the dark. And so he called for his mom. Mom, can you come in here and be with me? And so the mom was singing songs, and he says, Mom, would you sleep in the bedroom with me tonight? And the mom says, Honey, She kissed him on the forehead, and she says, I can't. I'm going to sleep in the bedroom with Daddy tonight. The little boy starts to whimper, and he says, that big sissy. (laughs) I get we we, we face fear at times, and when we act out of fear, I get that, right? I mean, it's being a part of human nature, but we have to challenge our minds, and we have to challenge our thoughts to make sure that we're not acting out of fear. Look what... Look, when we look here, it says, Abram makes this conscious decision. When he came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that he was a beautiful woman, and when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. Wait, hold up, time out. How many dudes do we have in here? Raise your hand, dudes. How many dudes are married or have been married? Keep your hands up. Okay. Okay. You can put your hands down. Time out. First of all, are you in the doghouse if you're Abram? Hey, we're going to go into a place here, and 
you know, some important people are probably going to come and they're probably going to want you to be their wife. So, can you just lie for me so that I'm not going to be killed or hurt? And just go along with it, right? Abram's acting out of fear made him 100% self-focused. I mean, write that down. When we act out of fear, oftentimes we completely get so engulfed in our own thoughts of self-preservations. What's in it for me? How is this going to benefit me? That's what fear does. It causes us to begin inward thinking about ourselves only. We get scared to death. God, I have no idea what this plan is, but I can tell you this right now. What's it going to do to me? Isn't that what we do? That's what Abram did. His acting out of fear took his wife's importance and completely minimized it. It would be like stepping on her and squishing her like a spider and saying, I don't care about you. I have no, I have no worry about anything that's going to happen to you. Uh, Pharaoh can take you and do whatever he wants that people do with their wives. I mean, let's just, let's just be a PG-13 here and call it like it is. Abram says, I don't care what happens to you, Sarah. I'm more worried about what's going to happen to me. I mean, that's literally recorded in Scripture what Abram says. My, my watch is talking to me. It says it can't find the answer to my question. Well, join the club. <laughs> Why in the world would Abram do something like that? Oh my gosh, I have no idea. Look at what it says. Look at what Abram said in verse 11. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarah, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me. But you get to live. Well, a lot they die. You get to live, Sarah. What about me? They're going to kill me. And so his acting out of fear makes him just completely minimize his, his wife's importance. I don't care what happens to you because you're going to be lucky enough to live. But what about me? That's what fear does. It causes us to self-focus so that we completely forget that there are people that are around us that are extremely important and valuable. They're extremely important and valuable because they're made in God's image, just like we are. He became self-focused. They'll treat me better. He had no concern for his wife, no concern for his livestock, his others. It's just all about me. And look, it says here in verse 16, Pharaoh, that's the he that he's referencing, Pharaoh treated Abram well for Sarah's sake. And Abram acquired sheep, and cattle, male and female donkeys, men servants, and maid servants, and camels. Abram got everything he wanted out of fear. What was his statement in fear in verse 11? They'll treat me well for your sake. And he got treated well. He got rich. From a worldly standpoint, Abram, got, Abram was in a much better situation now than he was two days prior. He now had a whole lot more servants. He had a whole lot more belongings. In those days, livestock meant wealth. He had a whole lot more wealth. And so as a result of his acting out of fear, it did benefit him from a worldly standpoint. But I cannot imagine, I cannot imagine the thoughts that are going through Abram's head at this point when his wife is taken into the palace. And the guilt and the shame that he was going through when he's thinking, I have, man, I've messed up so, so much now. I've gone against what God's plan was for me. I have completely taken my life out of God's hands and placed them into my own. And I am living a life absent of faith. Now, I, again, all the dudes that are married or have been married can probably understand the turmoil that Abram must be facing in this first night being in Egypt. It doesn't matter all of the belongings in the world that you have. If you don't have your wife, then you have nothing. Like, I, don't, I, I would rather have my wife than have a thousand, million, billion, trillion camels. First of all, I don't know what I'd do with them. And second, my wife is so much more valuable to me 
than wealth and belongings. And Abram had forgotten all of that stuff because he was acting out of fear. And yet, look what happens in verse 17. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarah. Remember God's promise? What was God's promise? I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who bring curses on you. Pharaoh had no clue that Sarah was married to Abram. That Sarah, in a in an equal relationship of matrimony, belonged not in possession, but in relationship to Abram. Pharaoh had no idea because Abram didn't allow him to know that. Abram told him a lie, half-truth, actually. Sarah was his half-sister, born of his dad, but not his mom. You find that out later in Scripture. And so, and so it was this half-truth that was told. Pharaoh had no idea And so therefore, he could not honor Abram and his family the way that perhaps he could have if Abram had just been honest with him. Or maybe Abram shouldn't even have been in Egypt in the first place. But Pharaoh did not kill Abram, so therefore God did not kill Pharaoh. And God rewarded him with life. However, because Pharaoh, even unintentionally and unknowingly, was bringing curses onto Abram's family by robbing Abram of his relationship of his wife, God steps in and fulfills his promise, even though Abram has said, I'm not even acting in faith at this point. Because God's promises are powerful. And when God gives his word, he does not go back on that. Abram forgot that. And I think at times we forget that as well. We, we start rationalizing and trying to come up with things that move us even away from faith and move us away from uh, what God's plan is because things just seem to be better doing something else or doing familiarity and comfort. We don't want to leave that. And yet we, we, we have this idea that perhaps God will get mad at us and angry with us even if we mess up. And yet history proves through Scripture that even in the middle of Abram's mistake, God's mercy reigns. And for that I say, come Lord Jesus, amen, thank you so much. And any other Christian cliche you ever grew up in church, because I need that. Personally, I need that. As a husband and as a father, as a human being, I need to remember that even in the middle of my mistakes, God's mercy reigns supreme. I need to know that as the leader of our church. That as we begin moving and acting in faith, hopefully, that we pray and say, God, where is it that you're wanting us to go? When we're doing that, we may make mistakes along the way. But God's promise is powerful in that he will say, I'll protect you. You act in faith, I'll protect you. And if you make a mistake along the way, I'll protect you also. And so that's huge, huge, huge for me. I love when scripture tells us, things that happened thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago that we can gain a modern day understanding and application to our own lives. It is so important for us guys as a church to remember the truths that we learned last week about God's promises, about his plans, about his protections. And it's equally as important for us to learn through today's text that it, we can't rely on our own thoughts here. That we have to come together and pray and say, God, what is your plan for us? What is your plan for Second Branch Baptist? And we have to personally pray for our own families. God, what is your plan for my family? And not act in fear. Sometimes when we pray those things, God, what is it that you want us to do? And he says, I want you to be uncomfortable right now. Because only through discomfort are you going to learn to depend on me better. Before I came to Chesterfield County, back in 2007, my wife and I believed in, uh, in, in December of 2006, actually, that God was possibly calling us away from our church. So in, t- in December of 2006, I walked in to my home and I said to my wife, I think the Lord's calling us away. And we prayed for three months we prayed for three months, and in the, at the end of those three months, our church was doing a revival service, and we fasted 
for an entire week through that revival service. And by the end of that service, we were 100% convinced that God was calling us away. And for the next almost three years, God never answered his, our prayers. For almost three years, we were praying, God, I don't understand this. Your plan for us was, we know for a fact that you're calling us away. And yet, you're going to let us be here? I mean, it doesn't make sense. You're calling us and planting this burden and passion on our hearts and only to be unfulfilled? And I called a mentor of mine and I said, can you help me? I'm, I'm just so frustrated with the Lord that we've been praying and praying and praying. And the only answer that God is giving us is no. And I'm baffled by this because this wasn't my thought. I, our church was going well. It was my wife's father who was the pastor of that church. He's a mentor to me. We had a great relationship, great working relationship, great personal relationship. All of our family, immediate family, lives in that hometown. It was the church that I was saved in and called to ministry in. It was the church that my father-in-law had been leading for 33 years. So my wife had been there for 33 years. It's a small town, Luray, Virginia. Everybody knows everybody. I mean, everybody knows everybody's business too. But everybody knows everybody. And we were so frustrated with the Lord. And I asked my mentor, I, I just don't understand. And he says, Chris, is your discomfort in not knowing the answer drawing you closer to the Lord in dependence or pushing you away from him? And I said, oh, I am definitely closer to the Lord now. I'm like saying, God, I mean, write it in the sky. Send me a leaf in the, under the door with your word on it. Whatever, I'll take any answer that you have to give to me. And my mentor said, then if, his, if, his, if your discomfort is causing you to be more dependent on him, then isn't his will fulfilled in your life? And I had to step back and say, whoa. I'm comfortable with God answering my question now. That's more comfortable to me. I don't like waiting almost three years for an answer. And yet through that process, my discomfort, our family's discomfort of not knowing what God's future was for us was causing us to be more dependent in order to act on faith. And that's what Abram missed. He missed the fact that the famine and then when he moved his family to Egypt, that this situation and this scenario, his thought life starts saying, man, I'm going to lose my life here. I'm in a place that's not, that's not uh, good for me to be in. And his thought life begins to take over and this fear begins to grip into him. And he loses his way. But thankfully, God's mercy prevails. I don't know where you are this morning, I just want you to take this next couple minutes, just bow your heads right where you are. I have no idea what you're experiencing in your life. Some of you I do. I realize that you're on a journey of cancer. We heard a lot of that in our Bible fellowship this morning, in a Sunday school class. We have the young people that are out there selling lemonade to bring awareness to cancer and help, hopefully resources. So I know some of your journeys are walking a difficult path of illness. Some of you have probably experienced job loss, loss of loved ones. And you can say, how is this the journey home? I just want to encourage you today and say a reminder that this world is not our home. That God's home for us is a place that he's prepared. In John 14, he says he's prepared a place for us and that he's calling us home there. And while we're on this temporary place... God has a plan for us as a church, as a people group, to go out into the community in order to reach those who have not yet been brought into his kingdom. He's calling us as a people group to learn every day what it means to be more dependent on him today than we were yesterday. And if you've been a part of God's family for a day or a decade, God's plan for you is the same, to become more dependent on him today so that you can be more dependent on him tomorrow and to live a life of faith, to walk in faith. Let us not make the same mistakes that Abram made. He did learn from them. We'll learn about that as the weeks progress. But let's not make the same mistakes that Abram did. As God is calling us to reach a people group around us, listen, it will be tough. And some of our comforts and some of the things that we find familiar with church will be challenged. 
Let's not act in faith, right? No, let's act in faith. Let's not listen to the Lord. No, let's listen to the Lord. We have this example in Abram of what happens. God can certainly prevail and his mercy prevails, but why test the Lord? So let's just act in faith. Lord, we come to you this morning. Each of us bring our own issues into the building. We all have our own issues. And you're calling us each to respond to whatever that is. God, help us to act in faith. Help us to learn the example of Abram and that when we forget that you've promised us things, when we forget that you have a home for us and you're calling us to just honor you with our steps. God, help us to remember that your promises are powerful. Teach us, Lord, to follow you. Teach us to follow you. Forgive us when we don't. We're thankful for when you give us mercy when we don't. As a church, Lord, may we be people of prayer, asking you to guide us, knowing that you're measuring our faith. And measuring our faith causes us to step toward the place that you have us to go. Help us, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us? If you'd like to come pray with me, you're welcome to do that during this song. If you'd like to see me after the service, I'll be here at the front as well. We're going to sing this closing song together, a song of worship and praise. So thankful that you're here. We love you. If we can do anything for you, let us know.
with me. Lord, send us out into your community. Help us be still and to know who you are and to know who we are in relation to you. May we not react out of fear. May we reach out and follow your plan, even when we are uncomfortable. In your name I ask it. Amen. Amen. Amen.